He reigns. He rules from heaven above. He rules above the circle of the earth. He rules. His wisdom is unmeasurable. The plan of salvation that he orchestrated, put together, knew that was going to take place before he even created the heavens and the earth. That's why the Bible says Jesus was slain before the creation of the world. He rules in wisdom. In wisdom and in power and in love. Everything he does is in love. Sometimes it's tough discipline, but it's love. Matt, just keep praying. Nobody's going, you just keep praying. No, you, you don't owe nobody nothing except your heart to God. Just keep praying, Matt. Just keep praying. You're not bothering no one. He rules in wisdom, in wisdom. He rules in wisdom. He redeems us through his son, Jesus Christ. That's good, Natasha, y'all can thank you. Thank y'all. You can be seated, but you can't turn off the faucet of God of worship. He rules in wisdom. The message today concerns part of that wisdom of God that is so extraordinary. We have a great high priest who is Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, escaped death from Herod. Because wise men listened to God and they left and then go back to Herod and because Joseph listened to the angel of the Lord and went down into Egypt. You and I will be preserved if we will listen to Jesus, follow his instructions. And so the, the, the message today is the temptation of Jesus, the trial, the baptism, and then his trip into the wilderness. It says in the last two chapters of the book of Matthew, as Jesus was baptized and as he come up out of the water, at that moment the heaven was opened. Another version, another Bible says, and as he was praying, the Holy Spirit come down upon him like a dove. And then God spoke to him from heaven and says, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jesus stepped out of heaven 30 years earlier, and he come to this earth, and now he knows that his ministry is about to begin. God the Father knows that his ministry is about to begin. But he's not beginning his ministry as God. He's beginning his ministry as God-man. Never used any of God power except what God told him to do it. He experienced everything. He walked in our shoes. Then was Jesus led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds or comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Most of you, Paul's, knows that verse comes from Psalms 91. But then Jesus also repeated back to Satan, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And so again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you would just bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, 
Can you read that sentence and see the exclamation point there at the end? Do you sense some authority that's in there? Away from me, Satan. Jesus wants to empower all of us, he wants us to have such faith in us so that we can speak to the principalities and the powers of dark. Away from me, Satan. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and they attended to him. We have an absolutely perfect, perfect, perfect Savior. The writer of Hebrews speaks that to Hebrew Christians that were scattered throughout the world that were being persecuted. They were even persecuted so much that the government was coming, confiscating their land. You can hear that in the 10th chapter of Hebrews. He says that the government would even confiscate their land, but the people still kept rejoicing. But here he says, for this reason, Jesus had to be like, made like his brothers in every way. In order that he might be a merciful and a faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself has suffered being tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. It says, Jesus was led by the Spirit. <laughs> God was not leaving his son without testing. He was led by the Spirit because he is fixing to begin ministry. And anywhere that God wants to take us to a higher place, we got to be tested and tried first. And so he was led by the Spirit, was there, and then God told him to fast 40 days and 40 nights. And I know that prayer and fasting builds us up spiritually, but also it leaves you depleted mentally and like you're physically tired. And it was the optimal moment for the devil to come and to begin to work on him. And have you ever had the devil work on you? Did he seem to come and to work on you at the worst point in your life? And the devil began to work on him. He was led by the Spirit. God was preparing his son for the ministry. And Jesus was learning what we have heard that Solomon wrote in Proverbs, trust in the Lord. So he had to trust in his father with all of his heart. And he had not to lean to his own understanding. Everything that he did there in the desert come by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. His entire life was run, dictated, led, whatever way you want to do it, by God's Spirit. That's why when Lazarus died, he didn't jump up and run real quick. And he didn't speak a word and send a word there to heal him as he had done on another occasion. God just told him to sit still. But Jesus knew in his heart, he says, this illness is not unto death, but for the glory. God's going to shine through this. What me and you go through in this life, if we deal with it in the right way, God's going to shine through this and show that his power works in our life. It works in your life. You may not be an Apostle Paul. You may not be a Peter. You may not be a Billy Graham. But Jesus Christ, his power, his word will work in your life. God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't show favoritism to the person at the other end of the pew, to the person that gives a message in tongues, an interpretation of tongues, or to the preacher, and then not turn his back on you. He won't turn his back on you. Faithful is who he is. Faithful. So fasting and praying will not exempt us from temptations. Jesus has walked in our shoes. He's able to sympathize with us. In this hour of temptation, Jesus demonstrated what he tells us that we need to do. Have self-discipline, control of our mind, control of our soul, and control of our spirit. Everybody say self-control. That's the only way the devil can whip believers is whenever we lose our spiritual self-discipline. Satan had no doubt. Satan had no doubt that that was, if you be the son, he had no doubt. That's why he's there. That's why he's telling Herod, go down there and kill the baby. That's why he's there because he knows that Jesus is the son of God. And Jesus has no doubt that he is the son of God. 
41 days ago at the baptismal, you are my son in whom I am well pleased. 12 years old, first Passover, maybe not the first one, but when he was 12 years old, the book of Luke tells us that they went to Jerusalem for the Passover, and they go in this caravan thing, much as you donkeys and oh, just a caravan it's a family event and on the way back to Nazareth just assuming Jesus is with cousins and friends they look for him that night and he's not in the tent so they have to go back to Jerusalem and after two days they find him and when they found him it says man you uh, son <laughs> they didn't slap him son you we worried about you he said, did you not know that I must be about my father's business or that I must be in my father's house? If, you, if I was lost, you, you, you knew where to find me. <laughs> so he knew, he knew who he was. He knew his call. He knew he'd come to redeem us. He knows that's why he is in the wilderness and told to fast for 40 days. He knows that's why the devil is there. The devil's there to trip him up. The devil's coming to do the same thing he hopes in Jesus' life that he did to Eve in the Garden of Eden. He wants to trip him up. And if you be the son of God, that the de that's the devil's greatest weapon maybe is lies and doubt. That's how he got Eve, is by casting doubt and speaking a lie. And he does that with Jesus. This is spiritual warfare at its very core when the devil begins to work on my mind and your mind and in our heart. And he says, God, that's spiritual warfare at the very core. That's why the psalmist David in one place says, how long, O Lord, before you come through for me? Because I know you, the faithful God. You can read Psalms 18, about verse number 7 or 8. David said, I cried to the Lord, and he answered me. Then he begins to speak about lightnings in heaven, and he speaks about thunder, and he speaks about rolling tempest. And he knew that his prayer was engaging the heavenly powers whenever we pray. Temptation comes to anybody and can happen at any time and at any place. Sometimes it happens after you had the greatest revival service in the land. God's Spirit come upon you and you feel like dancing and you God's Spirit come in your devotions. You just get such revelation. And then within 24 hours, he just smacks you as hard as he can. But it comes at any time. But understand this. God does not change. He comes at us in times of mental weakness and stress in our life. He builds it up and builds it up and builds it up and builds it up, and then he just unloads on you. And that's why Jesus says, come to me, everybody that's weary and heavy laden. That's when you need to learn more about my word. Any person that seeks to be used by God or any person that God wants to use in a bigger and higher way, the devil's going to come and mess with you. But we should welcome, welcome growing with God. We should welcome to grow with God. Even if it puts a bullseye on you. The devil's going to come after your life anyway. He's coming after us anyway. So we need to be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 6 and about verse 10 through verse number 18 or 20, but I just had verse 17 put up there. We, we, we find that Jesus defeated the devil using the word. But the word was available to him because at the baptism it says when he came up out of the water and he's praying, the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. And then in John, it says the Spirit abode on him. It did not leave, and so he was filled with the Spirit all the way through his life. And Jesus tells us in John 14, anytime we go through stress in this life, the Holy Spirit will bring... How many of y'all have ever lost your keys? Even if you got the fob... You ain't going to go out there. You aren't going to go out there and crank up your car and go somewhere unless you got the fob. How many of y'all have prayed to find your keys? How many of you have prayed to find your keys and you found your keys? 
So Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit will bring to our remembrance scriptures, verses that he has, we have read and we have memorized. We have read them and put them in our heart and we have glazed them. We have heard them from pulpits. Probably less than 10% of you in this room would know where to find this verse. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall, they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. You may not know that's in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, but you can quote the verse because you've heard it enough from pulpits or you've heard it enough from other people's lips. It is a powerful word. That means if we just sin, the Lord is my, the most popular, maybe even the most well-known psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me. So we find here, be strong in the Lord. We need to be strong in his word. Take the helmet of salvation. And the sword of the spirit, which is God's word. The last temptation that Jesus faced, he said, Away with me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the... It come from Deuteronomy. Every one of those verses come from... He defeated the Satan using the word. Whenever we pray for healing, we use the word. I am the Lord that heals you. Jesus, you said the works that you did, I can do also. In greater work, we use the word. Lord, you have said that you would be with me always to death. I will never find a place that I can't find you. We use the word. I will never leave you nor forsake you. We use the word. So we need to be strong in the Lord. That's why a strong, strong. In these verses prior to this, when it speaks about and we fight against, it says, stand your ground ground just just keep standing on that verse just keep stand standing your ground stand your ground god gives you a verse stand on it stand on it stand on it stand on it. stand your ground there is no sin in being tempted for jesus who was absolutely perfect never had sinned was tempted and temptation doesn't mean that we're going to fall because it says no trouble, no temptation, no trial has come to pass in my life, nor will it come to pass in your life except that it's common, it's known. Oh, somebody else has been through it. But God is faithful who will not leave you to be tempted there all by yourself, but will with the temptation make a way for us to escape. So God the Holy Spirit brought every verse out of the tool chest of Deuteronomy. How many of y'all thought Deuteronomy was a boring book? Out of Deuteronomy, he whipped up some swords and arrows and he went after the devil and he whipped the devil's backside. May I say that? He took such authority over him, he says, away from me. And he left. Another, in another place in the Bible, it says they left him for a season. The devil will never leave you alone forever and ever. He will come back. But he just wants. And right, let me just tell you this. Holy Spirit will be as effective to me and he is effective to you as it was to Jesus. He gave Jesus fighting words. We've, all, we've heard that saying before. Them are fighting words. Well, that's words that we're going to duke it out. But he gave Jesus fighting words that made him effective to win. He will do the same thing for you and for me. We just need to stay focused on God's purpose. Satan wants to derail us. If he could get Jesus to sin, Jesus' blood wouldn't mean nothing to me and you. It was sinless blood. Sinless blood. Sin, I will say that again. If he could have got Jesus to sin, his blood could not have washed away nobody's sins. 
Stay focused on God's purpose. John chapter number 3. The conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus. This is the first year of his ministry, and this is in the forefront, in the mid part, and the back part of Jesus' mind. He's speaking of this to Nicodemus in the first year of his ministry. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He, he knows it's coming, and he's keeping his life. It's there. Purpose, purpose, purpose. And I don't want the devil to derail me from the purpose God has for me, and I don't want you to let the devil derail you from the purpose that God has for you. Sometimes it's late in life when we really step into our purpose. Moses was 80 years old watching the sheep and God gets in his business. And he says, now it's time for you to step into your purpose. Everyone who believes in the Son of Man will have eternal life and receives Jesus Christ. Do you really know this is about the heart? Temptation is all about the heart. The first temptation, if you be the Son of Man, command that these stones be made into bread. There's some verses that's in John, not going to be on the screen, but it's in 1 John chapter 2, I believe, verses 15, 16, and 17. It makes this statement, don't love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anybody loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. So I just can't love the world. That can't be my goal. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. And so this turning this stone into bread was part of that lust of the flesh. My body just craves that. Whether it's a lot of different things in this world, our body craves. Some of it's legal. Some of it's not. Some of it, the timing would make it right. But it wasn't right now for Jesus. It's about faith. Jesus is beginning now to show more so what it is to walk by faith. I'm waiting for God to fulfill my desires. I'll eat when God tells me to eat. And so this is about the heart. So we find this, and Jesus defeated him. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Never think when you read the Bible, you're just reading idle words. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so Moses is telling this, this is, everybody has died that's going to die, that they was under the sentence of death because they had no faith. And all of these people, when they went to go into the promised land, he's speaking to, were 20 years old at that time. And so now the older group is up to 60 and they're about to go in. And he has reminded them of that 40 year journey. In fact, the ones that are 60 and 50 years old have been there ever since they left Egypt. And so they know why they are in that predicament. And he says this, remember how the Lord has led you through the desert these 40 years. God does want to humble every one of us in this room. <laughs> we don't want to hear that, but he did that to humble you. Nobody can go to heaven except that we believe that God is smarter than we are. Abundantly smarter. Abundantly smarter. You and I can never offer a plan to God and God says, ah, I never thought of that. You got some more advice for me? Abundantly smarter. To humble you, to test you, to know what was in your heart. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in our heart, isn't it? There's an incident that's called Masa, the well of quarreling. You know the story. You may not recognize the name and correlate the two. But when they got there and they found some bitter waters and they couldn't drink the water and then Moses prayed and God says, throw that tree into the water, which represents the cross. It's going to make things better. The cross of Jesus Christ makes things better. They throw the cross in 
And the waters were made sweet and they healed. And God says, I am the Lord your God who heals you. Emotionally, physically, mentally, in every way. There was not a sick person that left there. So they, but the first thing they did when they got to the bitter waters, a place that masa means quarreling. A lot of us, the first thing we do is start bickering with God. You don't care for me. I'm not doing my devotions today. You're not hurting me. You're hurting yourself. But I want to help you. I want to get you out of this. I want to carry your burden. Let me help you. Sometimes we don't have ears to listen, and we have to get so far down the road that we can't hear God saying, I want to help you. Elijah, a great man of God, ran for 40 days and 40 nights until he got into a cave, till he found the place where God could really start talking to him. Let me help you. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding us with manna to whether you nor your father did know to teach you that man does not live by bread alone but by every word. So we just need to be careful and very earnest to hear what God is speaking into our heart. It's about the heart. Proverbs 4.23 won't be on the screen, but Solomon says, guard your heart above all else because it determines the course of life. Let me read those temptations again. Won't be on the screen. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil takes him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And all this I will give you. He said, if you bow down and worship me, Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So we need to be firm and direct in our life. Second time that these words have been on the screen, but with a different verse this time. It says in 2 Corinthians, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Did you know a word spoken out of your mouth, a spiritual word, a spiritual sword can demolish strongholds? Can demolish the one that wants, and it does come to take peace from our mind and our spirit and our home that comes and keeps you bound even though you are saved, born again keeps you bound because you just never can get free from that little thing that's really a big thing, it's a weight that you can't shake off, condemnation you're just afraid to speak up and share Jesus with somebody else because the devil's always bringing up your past baggage but a word can send him down the road if we believe the word when we speak the word there Romans 8 and 1 there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus and then in Psalms 103 as far as the east is to the west so far as the Lord has removed my sins from me first John chapter 1 verse number 9 the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from so hollow that word, all sin, not just part of them, all of them. And so a word spoken can put the devil on the run if we have that word. The weapons we fight with. So we are strong in the Lord. We have to stand firm. First Peter chapter 5 verses 8 and 9. Verse number 7, you've heard it. Peter says, cast all your care on the Lord because he cares for us, all of it. 
I don't have anything. You don't have anything that's so big that Jesus don't want you to throw it upon him. But then he says this in the next words. We see this. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, self-controlled and alert. Recognize the devil's ploys and plots. Recognize God's spirit. Because when the devil comes and begins to reason with you why these troubles are coming, we need to hear God's spirit saying, I've got this. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. How do we defeat him the same way that Jesus did? Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same. Just stand firm. Jesus stood firm. Peter is telling his people that he's writing to in Asia, Cappadocia, Bithany, Asia. All of these places, you go back to the first verse in the first chapter, it tells you this letter went to 50, 60 churches. Everyone there, this verse fits them. Stand firm. Somebody else is going through this. God's got you. Jerry, would you come, please? We need to take dominion. Matthew 4, 10 and 11, Jesus says, away from me. Then the devil left him. Jerry's going to use the blue mic, and he's fixing to give you a testimony. But before he does, I'm going to read to you John chapter 10, verse number 10. The thief comes to, only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. How many of y'all have heard this verse before? 80% of you, 90% of you can quote it. The devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus has come. Jesus has come. Jesus went to 40 days of fasting. He defeated the devil. He gave his life on the cross. He didn't turn back, but he's come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. I asked Jerry to come and give this testimony. And you say, and when you hear it, the first, your mind's going to click. What has that got to do with this? Earlier in the message, I said, told you that Jesus used self-control, walked in self-control. Jesus is concerned with our physical, he's concerned with our mental, and he's concerned with our spiritual, our whole being. If he can mess with your mental, he can take your spiritual away. If he can mess with you physically, sometimes he can take this away. Jerry, uh, share. Good morning. Uh, a few years ago, I was going fishing. I took a week off to go fishing, and I, all week long I had gone. It was hot. It was like August. And uh, I wasn't catching anything but catfish, and I hate catching catfish. Now, on the weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they were allowing you to go out in state water and catch snapper, red snapper. And uh, I said, I think I'll go out there. Now, I have a huge flats boat. I have no business out there about eight or nine miles is where I went to, but, you know, I'm a hard head. And uh, I left that morning, and my wife said, make sure you wear your life jacket and all that. And uh, so I get out there, and I start heading. Now, it's a little bit rough. It ain't terrible rough, but it's pretty rough. And I get to my first spot. I have four spots. I know that three of them are good, and one of them's bad, and naturally I went to the bad one because I couldn't remember which one was the good ones. <laughs> so I started fishing. There's like five boats around me, and as I'm fishing, they slowly are leaving, so they must not have been catching anything either. And I say, well, I know where some spots are that are good. I think I'll go ahead and pull my anchor and head that way. And I, I put my engine in gear and move forward to grab my rope, get the slack out of the anchor line, and I started to pull it up, and and a big wave hit the boat, threw me up in the air, and I landed hanging on the side of the boat. And it's moving about three to four knots. And I can't, I can't get in. I'm trying hard, and I, I, and I can't get in. I ain't got the strength, and I, and I ain't got no leverage because my legs are behind me. So the anchor line roll pulls up beside me, and I wrap my leg, and it looked like a candy cane by the time it was done. Uh, but... This went on for about 40, 45 minutes. I've been trying to get in this boat, and I'm getting tired. And I said, I, said, I better do something or I'm going to die out here because I can't swim eight miles. 
especially not in rough water. And so I devised an idea. I'm going to pull this anchor line around the front of my boat and come back to the other side of my engine. And there's a button that will trim the motor up. It'll probably blow my engine, but it'll stop the boat. So I started trying to do that. And I get up there until about a foot going around the front of that boat. And I could not get it up. So I go under the boat, and I reach up and grab my trolling motor. And I'm still sitting there trying to jerk that line about around that bow. And then it, the boat goes way up in there and slams down. And it threw me off the boat. And the boat's going by, and I'm reaching, trying to grab it, but I couldn't do it. And I, I'm watching the boat leave me, and I said, God, I need your help. Before I even got help out, that motor shut off. I took off swimming as hard as I could because the boat's still moving around me after I got a little bit shocked there that it shut off like that. And I got to the boat, and I reached up on my polling platform, and I pulled myself up on the back deck, and I laid there for a long time. I was tired, almost to throw up, and I'm saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for sparing my life. And I, after a while, I got some strength, and I pushed my seat down and rolled into the boat. I'm still too tired to move. I laid there for a while. I'm thirsting to death. My mouth is so dry. But the water's in the front of the boat, and I eventually got enough strength to move forward, and I grabbed my knife out of my center console, cut my anchor line, and grabbed some water. And I went to the back of the boat and sat down, and I turned the key, and it zing, cranked right up. And I headed in. Now, I was so tired and so weak, and there was nothing I could do. But in my weakness, he is strong. And God will make a way where there seems to be no way. I, I had all hope was gone. None of Jerry, no more. Only God. And he spared my life. I should have listened to my wife and put on my life jacket. But God is so good, and I'm so thankful for what he's done. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. I know Jesus was in a spiritual temptation, but Jesus is as concerned about your physical life, your mental life, and your spiritual life. Absolutely every bit of it. Natasha, would you come? Jesus wants to help us. Wants to help us. He has grace. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses. Jesus can sympathize. He's walked in our shoes. But one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. I want every one of you to read that last verse under your breath, out loud. But I want the words to come out of your lips. The one who sympathizes with us the one who cares for us, spiritual, mental, physical, our entire being, is seated on the throne of grace, and he sympathizes with us. He sympathizes with us. And he wants us to come to the throne of grace with, everybody say the word, confidence. So that we can receive mercy and that we can find grace to help us in our time of need. And we don't get so spiritually strong that we don't have times of need, desperate need. Jesus was baptized, 40 days of fasting and praying. Afterwards, he's hungered. He's about to, the weakest shape he has ever been. And the devil comes and starts messing with him, and he firmly defeats him. He went all the way through to the cross and defeated him at the cross and went to the grave. And he rose, and now Jesus is in heaven wanting to 
have his blood wash away our sins, but also have his victorious life come into us so that we can live in victory. Go ahead, Natasha. Fixing to give you another opportunity this morning to come forward for prayer. The Lord, our help, living victorious through Jesus, more than conquerors through Christ. He has come that we might have life and have life. The weapons of our warfare, they are not natural weapons like anybody, ha anybody else uses, but they are powerful weapons. And he wants to come and enforce them in our life. Your life, our lives, our church. I know we have guests in the house this morning. But I want you to let the Holy Spirit work in your life as if you were been here all your life and you have no inhibitions. And you that have been here all your life, I want you to throw aside everything else. If you are not saved, I want you to know the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you, wash you clean. 